Good afternoon, and uh, thank you all for coming to our seminar series in public health. Um, as you all know, we invite uh, distinguished um, researchers, practitioners uh, to visit, visit our campus. Uh, these invitations depend on the network that we and our faculty, students, and sometimes staff have built over several uh, years. And sometimes they are based on new networks that we all want to form. And um, this is the reason why we host lunch afterward and invite you all to join and interact with the speaker. Uh, but this series will not be successful if it's not for the hard work of our distinguished faculty members. And today, I'm delighted to introduce to you, first in this quarter, uh, Professor Gu Yun Yan, uh, who is the host for our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Yan's done a lot of uh, great work in global health. He's an expert on, on malaria, and um, you're, we're very lucky to have him uh, here in public health at UCI because, in fact, we share him with many other uh, centers and field sites around the world. If uh, you don't have him uh, as an as a, uh, instructor in a course or as an advisor, please make time to uh, meet with him, uh, email, or just uh, talk about his work. Read his papers, uh, very important. He's a frequent flyer. If he's not here in Irvine, he's in Thailand or Kenya or China. Or, uh, and so I'm really delighted that he's able to join us today and to bring uh, our speaker to our campus. So please join me to thank Dr. Yang. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Betty. Uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the seminar speaker of today, uh, Dr. Philip Akhop. Um I met Phil uh, two, about two years ago near a meeting uh, in Italy. It's a golden conference on malaria. So Phil uh, gave a great presentation about uh, his uh, computer simulation on malaria control and eradication. Um, Phil uh, grew up in Haiti, right? so, uh, and his parents uh, worked in the humanitarian hospital uh, in Haiti. Uh, and uh, I just said that your parents now, uh, his parents worked in Afghanistan. So it's very really, um, devoted uh, um, physician. Um, and Phil um, grew up in Haiti and then went to uh, University of Texas, Texas in Austin uh, for his bachelor degree uh, and uh, um, Princeton University uh, for a PhD. His PhD is not in biology, it's actually in uh, applied and uh, computational mathematics. So it's uh, so nice that to have people from uh, math and engineer background to work on malaria. So it's really uh, 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 it's this kind of expertise we need. So uh, we need not only biologists, but we also need uh, people from uh, other disciplines to help with uh, malaria control. So uh, Phil, uh, there's a couple of distinctions. I don't want to read the, um, um, a long list of distinctions. Uh, one of the ones is that he received a special achievement award as a health fellow uh, in 2009 for his work on malaria modeling. Uh, he serves on the board of directors for the Fanny and the John Hayes Foundation. So uh, as Phil is a really young, distinguished uh, scientist, uh, and so we are so pleased to have him to uh, give a seminar today. Um, so Phil works for an organization called uh, Intellectual Ventures. Uh, so uh, in Italy, and Phil explained explain this to me about the organization is, uh, and it's perhaps you, know, you can use a few uh, minutes to explain the organization sure. and the project. <laughs> so, sure. All right, so um, without further ado, please welcome Phil Akhoff. <laughs> All right, th thank you very much. It's uh, great to be with you uh, today. I'll, um, my name is uh, Philip Ekhoff, and uh, I'm the PI for a group that builds computational models of disease at Intellectual Ventures up in uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, this is part of our projects as part of this uh, Global Good Funded Intellectual Ventures, which works on a series of projects targeted uh, for improving uh, global health, global development, and uh, provides these uh, uh, projects uh, for, for free in a, a not-for-profit uh, for developing world uses. 
Um, my, the particular project that we work on is uh, builds computational models of disease. It focuses on building models that uh, support uh, planning public health campaigns, um, policy decisions, scientific investigations. And we also uh, provide uh, software that actually implements the models that other researchers can use. Uh, this lets people understand uh, transparently what's actually in the computer uh, simulations and actually uh, start using it in their own research programs. So I wanted to just take a, a moment just to uh, talk about what does mathematics have to do with uh, public health and what, what is a mathematical model of disease? Because all of us who, who work in public health work with disease transmission uh, have a real sense in which, in which we're modelers. We have a mental picture of how diseases work. We have a certain, in the context of malaria, we have a certain concept for how a mosquito population dynamics will interact with human populations, will interact with weather, with climate, uh, with the different geography, and then uh, will also be linked to the transmission of the parasite. Uh, different, level, different people, uh, based on their experience, their expertise, will have different resolution of these mental models. As, uh, but people have the general trends. When it's, when it's rainier and warmer, you'll have uh, more malaria transmission. When you have uh, bed nets, you'll limit the amount of uh, mosquito bites that happen indoors at night, and uh, so on. But then as you get uh, more and more expertise, more and more detail, more and more resolution, the mental models create a lot more detail, and you start thinking through the questions as far as how does the local mixture of mosquito species change when you scale up bed nets? What happens if you try and do larval control? Uh, how much do, uh, does it, if you have a cluster of villages where people move back and forth, how much do, does the malaria parasite actually move with people to where you can reintroduce it into villages where there wasn't as much malaria before? This gets to the point where you start asking some very complicated, very detailed, very high resolution questions. And then all of a sudden, the, the assumptions, the input data, the sensitivities become very difficult to actually just think through just all in, in just, just in the mind. And that's where the mathematical and computational models come in. Creating a model basically is a, uh, is a simulation. You create a set of rules for the computer program or for the mathematical model that govern how the disease moves, how the disease transmits, and how the disease progresses over time. It forces you to become very explicit about what assumptions are, are going into the disease dynamics, and it uh, very much as far as what do you understand and what do you not understand. For the input parameters, what is the level of uncertainty on the inputs? And how does that level of uncertainty on the input data translate into uncertainty in the outputs? For instance, control of malaria, uh, reducing the mosquito populations, and eventually reducing the uh, malaria parasite. This uh, project that we worked on began back in 2007 after uh, uh, Margaret Chan from WHO and uh, Bill and Melinda Gates announced a new effort to eradicate malaria worldwide. We've learned a lot of things over the last co couple decades of, about malaria control. And there's a real question as far as what's then involved in going from uh, malaria control, where there's been a big scale up as far as access to new artemisinin combination therapies, access to insecticide treated nets to go, go from the substantial gains in public health as far as reducing the amount of tra malaria transmission, the number of cases, the number of deaths, to actually getting rid of it everywhere. There are some very difficult areas with very high levels of transmission and what's involved. Whenever constructing a, malaria, uh, a mathematical model, one of the important things is what are the key questions involved? Because you want to use as simple a model as possible that can still address the questions. So before starting any uh, mathematical modeling uh, exercise, one of the key questions is, what, uh, one of the key things that has to be thought through is what are the specific questions for this model to address? And here are a couple of the ones that we, we try and work on in our model of malaria. What combination of tools is necessary and sufficient to interrupt transmission for a given transmission setting? Uh, the, different areas will have different baseline transmission tensity. In some areas, people will receive several hundred infectious bites a year. In some areas, on average, it will be less than one uh, bite per year over the population. That's a huge range of baseline transmission intensity, which you might approach that with very different control strategies as far as what level of coverage, for how long, and what combination of things would be involved. There's a big effect of vector ecology and behavior. Where do the mosquitoes breed? What does the life cycle in that particular area look like for that mix of species? Uh, in certain parts of East Africa, you'll have a, a mix of Anopheles arabiensis, Anopheles gambiae, Anopheles finestis. They might respond in different ways based to uh, introduction of bed nets based on where they predominantly feed. 
Anopheles arabiensis will feed outdoors more and feed on uh, cattle more than the other species do. So it, it, you, one would anticipate that it, it is impacted less by a scale-up of interventions like bed nets, which target primarily indoor feeding on humans. We, uh, there's also um, malaria control happening all over the world, ranging as all the way to the Solomon Islands in the Pacific. And I'll finish up with an example of looking at malaria control in the Solomon Islands, where uh, mosquito ecology and mosquito behavior is very different than what you would see in East Africa. And so the type of uh, approaches that you would use to control it end up being substantially different as well. Then uh, it's not just about the mosquitoes, but what are the dynamics of the, of the reservoir of parasites in the human population once transmission is interrupted? What happens, to, there will be dynamics, and even if people aren't getting new infections, uh, infection, uh, parasites can persist in the human bloodstream for quite a while. Uh, what's the impact of that? How long do you need to reduce transmission? What are the impacts, uh, effects of introducing new in interventions such as transmission blocking vaccines? A lot of the times, we have the tools that, we cur that currently exist, and then we have new tools that are in the pipeline. There's people uh, uh, here and in uh, universities and labs all over the world working on developing new drugs, new vaccines, new ways of killing mosquitoes. And one of the key questions ends up becoming, while you're still in development, before you actually get it out into the field, how good does it need to be? When you do your uh, early trials, when you do your lab tests and see a, a preliminary efficacy, is that good enough or do you have to keep going and driving the efficacy higher? Uh, when is it ready to kind of move into the field? A lot of these simulations and mathematical models give you a chance to test things out in simulation to see if it's killing this fraction of mosquitoes, what kind of impact could we expect to see in a community trial? And uh, then actually help plan out how to design the community trial, the sample sizes, the, the spatial scales of that trial. And then finally, what are the effects of changing the distribution of interventions? Um, we also do some work on, on polio, and this ends up becoming very important as far as looking at the uh, correlations in coverage. People right now for polio do re uh, many repeated rounds of vaccination in northern Nigeria, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, uh, to, uh, the last countries that, that have cases. And it turns out that they achieve a moderately high coverage with each of these rounds, but there's very high correlations between what children you can access each time. So it's not that you're getting a random 80% of, of the uh, children less than five, you're getting a very highly correlated subset of children every single, every single round, which means that the fraction of children who have not been vaccinated doesn't necessarily decrease as fast as you wanted. So this becomes very important as far as uh, malaria control as well. If we're giving out access to uh, improved anti-malarial drugs, if we're giving out access to uh, bed nets, if we're actually controlling uh, larval habitat in a better way and improving housing conditions, how do the correlations of these in space and time actually impact the overall uh, effect that we would want to see? So when we took a step back and said, okay, uh, for, for, the set, uh, for the set of these questions and for looking at now malaria eradication, not just reducing the cases but getting it all the way to zero, what are the effects that we need uh, in different components of the modeling system? We're going to need geographic scale because uh, the parasites and mosquitoes can move around. Y we can't just look at a single place. But at the same time, we have to understand what's happening with local resolution. What happens as far as the local mosquito habitat, the local housing conditions? What is the coverage with, uh, with uh, habitat modification, with uh, bed net coverage, with drug access that we get in each location? Uh, we want to understand uh, the re re realistically how single infections progress, both when it's a first infection with malaria and when someone has been infected several times. And then also the details of the vector population, their behavior, uh, in, uh, what happens if you get insecticide resistance uh, to uh, bed nets and the impact of climate and weather. So we started building a, a basic individual based uh, framework for this model and we realized then that a lot of the work that goes into constructing these models uh, is generalizable. You have to construct a realistic uh, population of individual agents, simulated individual agents with the right age distribution, with the right spatial distribution, how they move around in some cases, socioeconomic status ends up being important, and then how uh, the campaign is going to be giving out these interventions. Then there's actually, so we, so, we, so we basically were able to extract all those features and put that in a, a base level of the model and the, of the software, which we uh, share with other groups, to where if someone wanted to start uh, modeling a different disease, they can actually get that whole framework and, and get a real head start on building a more detailed model. Then the next level of the modular uh, 
uh, model structure is involved in how the uh, disease gets transmitted. Today I'm going to focus all entirely on the vector transmission code, which is vector-borne transmission. But we also do work with airborne transmission for tuberculosis, a sexual transmission for HIV, and a more environmental transmission for polio. Um, so moving forward, uh, all these models end up being very important on the quality of the input data. When we look at looking at country scales, continental scales, uh, what does coverage mean, what does transmission mean, we want to understand where the people are, uh, how these uh, population densities change over time. We want to understand uh, migration patterns. Uh, so when looking at the last stages of, uh, of the polio campaign in India, we did a lot of work as far as understanding how people move around throughout uh, India, connecting areas where that still had cases with areas that did not. And then understanding uh, climate patterns as far as temperature profiles, humidity profiles, rainfall profiles. We've done a lot of work looking at kind of uh, malaria dynamics in Madagascar. And then how we divide this up in an efficient way. Uh, I'm, I'm going to keep the math to a minimum, but when you're running large-scale simulations, it becomes very important as far as how you divide up the computational workload across your available computing resources. And there are some uh, tricks that you can do to actually make it as efficient as possible. So uh, moving more specifically into uh, what we do for malaria, I mentioned we try and keep the code very modular. Uh, what this lets you do is it, it becomes very clear for someone coming in to understand transparently what the model is intending to do. People won't pay attention to a model, won't, won't look at a model unless it's uh, transparent and they can understand how specific things are, are implemented. You don't want it to be a black box that you just put in numbers, some result comes out and you say, okay, I'll, I'll trust that. You want to make sure it's rigorously investigated, rigorously examined, and the modularity makes it easy to do that. It also becomes very easy because not everyone who will work with it is going to be an expert in every aspect of malaria. So you want the people who are entomologists, you want them to be able to move quickly to the part of the model that focuses on the uh, mosquitoes, uh, their ecology, their behavior, uh, their, how they interact with disease transmission. People who are very interested in the parasite, you want them to be able to see, here's how the dynamics of the parasite uh, work within the individual people and respond to immunity, the de development of, of immunity over successive infections and continued uh, uh, exposure. So uh, data ends up becoming very important as far as climate, demographics, age distribution, where people are, how people move around, um, the vectors, the campaign elements as far as bed nets, uh, certain aspects of those, and then individuals, both for infections and immunity. So um, I mentioned this a bit earlier, but one of the key things now is we get down to that first question, which is what I'm going to focus on for most of the rest of the, of the time. What combination of tools is necessary and sufficient in a given setting based on uh, the uh, details of local vector population? Looking at what we have right now, um, we have uh, insecticide-treated bed nets. We have indoor residual spraying where they spray insecticide on the walls of a house. So we're after a mosquito feeds on, on people inside the house. It fly, it, in some, for some species, it'll fly and rest on the wall to process the blood meal. And while that's happening, it gets exposed to the pesticide and dies. Uh, there's housing modifications, looking at uh, improving uh, screening, improving uh, the ability of the houses to keep vectors out. Um, and this is one reason why, as you see an overall improvement in, in, in the socioeconomic status of an area, you'll see transmission go down, just because the housing conditions are getting better, the landscape is getting better. There, there's a different set of, of life, of, of link conditions, which ends up being very important for malaria. Um, repellents, traps, drugs, improved diagnostics, larval control, space spraying. And then there's a number of things under, under development, uh, different types of vaccines, both pre erythrocytic vaccines that uh, try to stop the infection before it gets uh, into the bloodstream, so either in the sporozoite stage or in the liver stage. And then transmission blocking, um, as which is given to people to keep the gametocytes in the human blood from it, uh, causing the mosquitoes to become infected. There's uh, modified mosquitoes. Um, there are some techniques being applied currently for dengue uh, using Wolbachia. There's also um, homing endonucleus genes, different types of approaches where you can actually reduce the ability of the mos local mosquito population to transmit malaria. Um, new anti-malarial drugs, uh, mosquito killing fences, improved diagnostics. So we, we've, phrased a, we've phrased a question. We, we want to understand for a given area, how do we understand transmission in area? How do we understand the mosquitoes? And how do we come up with a plan? A combination of bed nets, larval control, drugs, maybe vaccines down the road that will actually be able to interrupt transmission. 
So we've defined what we want to do. We've defined some of the features. So now we have to actually go through and figure out how to model the, the mosquitoes. So we start out with a population structure that supports multiple species and, and mating structures within a species. So uh, this mating structure allows you to look at kind of the prevalence of, say, an insecticide resistance gene within the population um, and seeing the spread of that over time. Uh, the, the state space as far as whether a mosquito is infec infected but not yet infectious or infectious and ready to transmit malaria. Um, how the populations respond to weather and the impact of interventions. Just mo looking through this uh, life cycle, we start, uh, we start out with uh, eggs that get laid in habitat, progress through um, uh, the aquatic phases, uh, through larval development, pupil development. Then there's the time when they emerge from the aquatic habitat but haven't yet started to uh, uh, blood feed. This is a period of time there might be a couple sugar meals that get taken, they mate uh, during this interval, and then start a... Uh, uh, overall cycle in the adult life, span where, uh, life cycle where they uh, feed on humans and lay eggs. Every so often though, um, the, a mosquito will become actually infected from feeding on a person uh, with, uh, malaria, with malaria parasites, the gametocyte, the sexual stage of the malaria parasite uh, in the bloodstream and become infected. This then creates a certain interval of time uh, during incubation in the mosquito until the mosquito is infectious and able to transmit. One of the things that we really wanted to do is we wanted to look at what happens when temperatures are changing over the course of a couple weeks. Uh, so how long this incubation period takes depends on uh, the overall temperature. So when it's warmer, it goes faster. When it's cooler, it goes slower. When it's cool enough, it, you, the incubation period ends up being longer than you expect the mosquito to actually be alive. So it, um, in areas that are tended to be at high elevation or in cool areas, um, transmission becomes very unstable, becomes very marginal, and may, in some cases, might, might be supported for a few warm months of the year. The mosquito population can exist, but uh, it's not uh, transmitting mosquito robustly because even though it can lay eggs during the first part of its life and actually keep the mosquito population going, it's not going to actually survive long enough to incubate the parasite uh, in sufficient numbers. So we wanted to deal with what happens as far as uh, this capacity to transmit. So each day, based on the average temperatures for that day, an infected mosquito increments its basically a progress meter towards, uh, being fully in, towards being fully infectious. You look at the temperatures for that day, and basically it, it'll have the, the, a cohort or, an, or, a specific, or a specific mosquito will have a number that goes from zero to one associated with it. And it basic, based on the temperature, you increment that, and when it hits one, it's now infectious. So this means that if it's warmer one day, cooler the next day, if you get a period where for a week it's cooler, um, it's supposed to actually respond to um, that and take longer for an incubation period. Rather than saying the incubation period is always this fixed amount, this can now very easily in this structure handle changing temperatures. Then the feeding cycle. Uh, what this basically does is we want to have a model of the feeding cycle where different interventions could plug in in different ways. Um, this is more complicated than a typical run of the model would be because this is just where all the different aspects fit in. And usually you wouldn't have all of these there at the same time. But for example, uh, a mosquito, if a mosquito is trying to feed, it's a question, is the mosquito going to feed on an animal or on a human? You might see more radiensis feeding over here than on the human. But if, if it's on the human, is it feeding indoors or outdoors? If it's feeding outdoors, it, there's a good chance of it succeeding. Then it's a question of does it survive long enough for the two to three days until it can lay its eggs. Indoors, there's a question of did it get into the house or did the housing condition, uh, improved housing uh, conditions keep it out? Um, if it got in, did it get repelled by spatial, gets to the house, does it get repelled by a spatial repellent? If someone has, say, one of those mosquito coils or one of the new um, uh, repellents that's currently being worked on. Um, if, the, if it does get there, is the person under a bed net? If it's protected by a bed net, is the bed net physically intact or not? Um, and so we, we can basically look at, for have, if an individual person has a bed net, there's kind of a uh, value associated with that as far as whether the net is still has its physical integrity or not, and then whether the uh, insecticide on the net is, is still uh, working and what's the kill rate uh, for mosquitoes that interact with that bed net. If it does actually uh, feed and then rests on the wall, if there was um, indoor residual spraying, it has a chance to kill it there. And then if, if it survives that, it'll get out uh, to be able to lay its eggs. 
So, in a, so this is just where those different components plug in. It's basically a series of choices, each with a, fix, with a fixed probability that you can measure in, basic, in, in different field trials where you test bed nets, test indoor residual spring, test sp spatial repellents like the big test that was just done in Indonesia. And then start building these things out and then you can actually start assembling overall probabilities with certain uncertainties for um, what's the overall outcome. Does a mosquito actually successfully feed? Does it actually die before ever feeding? Does it feed but then die before it can lay eggs? And you can build up a whole set of outcomes. So this lets us actually look at a series of dynamics and look at the impact of several parameters. So this was looking at a couple sites in, um, in Tanzania and looking at different levels of coverage with indoor residual spring. Uh, blue was, ends up being baseline, green, red, cyan, uh, magenta, et cetera, is increasing levels of coverage. This was a situation where uh, the, the insecticide being used had developed a certain level of resistance where the killing rate was lower than here, where it kills a high, much higher fraction of the mosquitoes. What you can see is that there's a certain impact on the um, overall population densities. But then, uh, because it's killing mosquitoes, it's uh, fewer are, are living lo a long time, fewer are surviving to lay eggs for a longer period of time. But you'll see an, a, a dramatic impact also on the sporozoite rate. This is how many mosquitoes are actually, actually have fully made it to the infectious stage and are able to transmit, uh, able to transmit malaria. Because for that, you not only need to have a mosquito population, you need to have a mosquito population that lives long enough to incubate the parasite. And so killing at a certain rate restructures the age population of the mosquitoes. And, even, and for a given reduction in the uh, population density, you might see an even more dramatic represent, uh, reduction in the um, fraction that are infectious. And then if you look at the force of infection, the entomological inoculation rate, this is basically how many bites per person um, are, are, being, are being experienced, you'll see a bigger reduction in, the, in, in that EIR than for the adult population. So then one of the important things is looking at how does, um, one of the big things that models can give you is, is an understand, is, is an, an ability to evaluate what are the assumptions that matter. If we, if we have to make an assumption, does that assumption really severely affect our answer? If we have an input parameter that's uncertain as far as what's the current level of insecticide resistance, how much does that affect the dynamics? How much does that affect the results? So it's very, we, we do very extensive sensitivity analyses where you explore in many different dimensions of parameter space what ends up affecting the variable of interest, which in our case is whether we were able to interrupt transmission in a given location. And so here you can see different impacts as far as uh, coverage of different, uh, of, of different interventions, bed nets and IRS, uh, based on different underlying transmission intensities and whether or not there was insecticide resistance. And then looking at the overall impact of um, mosquito behavior. So in this particular simulation, we had a local species of Anopheles gambae sensu stricto, which predominantly feeds indoors and on people, a population of Anopheles finestis, uh, which has slightly different larval ecology, but also feeds primarily indoors on people, and then Anopheles arabiensis, which um, has a broader range of host selection, sometimes feeds on cattle and often feeds outdoors. So it can often, it's often less susceptible to um, a uh, intervention such as bed nets or IRS, which targets mostly indoor feeders. So you can see here we were looking at uh, host selection, host preference. More here means you feed on people more often, and here means you feed indoors more often. And you can see that in this particular location, um, blue means transmission was interrupted, red means it was not. Um, in this particular location, we basically showed that when, if Anopheles arabiensis was feeding outdoors, uh, even more, uh, in this location, more, more than 20% of the time, um, the ability to interrupt transmission would be very low. Okay, sorry. Yeah. The, the, the top panels on the bottom, yeah. I, I may have missed it. The undulation, the peaks, and not, oh, I'm sorry, on the left, oh, the yes. graphs. Oh, yeah. the, those aren't seasonal. <coughs> What is responsible for the peaks and the uh, no, this, 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 was, this was seasonal. Here, this is, so, so sorry, I'll, I'll show it uh, right here. This, this is kind of based on that similar site. Um, they, I probably should have gone through this first. But this was looking at um, historical weather data for a couple sites. In this one right here is, is a site in Tanzania. And these were two sites in Nigeria. 
And so here, what we do to construct a uh, local simulation as far as with the, understand with the uh, given species is uh, looking at what were the temperature profiles re recorded in those areas, and what was the historical rainfall by month. In some areas, it's by every two weeks. In some areas, it's every month. In some cases, we have close to daily rainfall. So the quality of the data is going to depend on that. Then you basically construct what your local vector populations are going to be. And you can, uh, it, so basically here we had, there was good measurements of uh, mosquito abundances for a three year period. So during that three year period, we can basically um, fit the model based on um, details of, of, of mosquito, models for mosquito habitat, which translate the uh, temperature and rainfall and humidity, other factors uh, into um, larval, uh, the ability of, of a location to sustain um, mosquito larvae. And then from that, you can basically match the, uh, the overall time series for the adult mosquitoes, uh, for Rabiensis, Finestis, Gambiae, et cetera. So, that, that, and that, so that, that's how we uh, basically constructed that. For this one, there was a very strong signal as far as when you get the, these uh, air times, you get uh, rainfall and uh, there's a time of the year when you have both uh, abundant rainfall and warm enough temperatures. And those tend up, end up being the times when um, you actually got that peak there. So this was a seasonal forcing. And you'll end up seeing that uh, during this area here, you'll get even stronger dips during, during the uh, cooler, drier times. When, it, when incubation, uh, mosquito incub uh, the incubation period in the mosquito takes longer and you can actually reshape the age structure even more dramatically relative to the incubation period. But does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry for uh, not being uh, clear on that. Um, I'm not gonna spend time on it now, but uh, there's, we, have, we, we have a paper that kind of uh, lay, lays out how we structure within host parasite dynamics. Um, as far as looking at the life cycle uh, of the parasite within human host, from uh, um, mosquito bites into the liver, going into the bloodstream where there's this asexual cycle where uh, it infects red blood cells, it, it incubates new parasites within the red blood cells, it splits out and they uh, invade new red blood cells. Uh, this is the asexual cycle. You've got um, the merozoites here basically invading other red blood cells. Some of them though, actually create gametocytes, both male and female. This is the sexual stage of the parasite. And a mosquito feed will take up several, will take up both male and female uh, gametocytes, and uh, then it'll incubate through uh, several life stages within the mosquito until it's infectious and able to actually in, uh, create a new infection in, in people. Uh, there's models for how do you look at the immune response, both innate immunity, uh, the adaptive response, and uh, how wh whether the person was infected with a homologous or reinfected with a homologous or heterologous strain um, can impact the uh, response to future infections. Um, so one thing within here, this is very interesting. The, the Garkey project. These were a series of sites that, um, in the early 1970s, there was a, a concerted effort to understand what was required to achieve uh, control and elimination in a very high transmission setting in West Africa. Um, this was a series of villages across this one district of Nigeria, the Garki district, which ranged uh, with a, from a, in transmission from a, a total infectious bites per year down in the 15 to 20 range to up to over uh, 120, 150 or so. So om over an order of magnitude, uh, about an order of magnitude variation in transmission. And they had both Gam uh, Anopheles gambia sensulatu, which was some combination of gambia and arabiensis, which they didn't necessarily know at the t uh, know the specific division at the time. They measured that later in the 1970s, and then uh, Anopheles finestis. Um, one of the things that was that, and so, depending on the location, so this was one village, uh, Segungum, which was right near a very swampy area. So you actually see more of uh, Anopheles finestis with this more semi-permanent aquatic vegetation habitat uh, there than you did in Rafen Mark, which was further away from there and mainly, mainly had the mosquitoes that um, pr rely predominantly on temporary puddle habitat. Um, so we went back, one of the first things we did was look at a couple areas as far as uh, what happened during those three years of Garki um, and what happened as far as the lead up um, in terms of different areas, um, 
looking at the, they, they had some villages that basically were left at baseline, which is blue, some areas that just had indoor residual spraying, which was green, um, some areas where they also did mass drug administration, where every uh, roughly about 10 weeks or so, they'd go out and give uh, anti-malarial medication to as many of the people as they could find in those villages. And then they had uh, a series of villages where they basically did the mass drug administration every 10 weeks or so throughout the year, but then every two weeks during the uh, high season of malaria. And you could see that although the IRS by itself ended up uh, limiting some of the peaks and shifting things slightly, it didn't achieve very big reductions in uh, the prevalence rate um, on average across all the different locations. But the drug uh, treatment did, but didn't quite get to zero. So we did a couple studies as far uh, studies and simulation as far as what happens if you had improved the coverage, if you had added uh, new vaccines, or uh, did the campaign for longer, and what would have happened as far as uh, sorry, different uh, abilities to interrupt uh, over time. And we basically several things that we found were uh, doing the campaign for longer, incorporating new tools such as a vaccine and extending the um, indoor residual spraying earlier into the dry season before the lead up and further into the dry season after the high transmission season. Um, all those things together actually did achieve uh, interruption in several of the uh, Garkey sites, but that the campaign as it had been constructed didn't, didn't get there. Um, Sorry, did your model then show is that resistance the rate? Uh, no, no, so th this, this right here, great, great question. So at the end, they stopped doing, they, they, they stopped the spraying and they stopped giving out drugs. And after that you see within uh, basically a year and a half, you see a strong rebound where malaria returned to original levels. They had stopped doing their active control stuff, but they made sure, they, they tried to make sure that drugs were available to treat any severe cases that, that started there. So this is basically in here, this was if you got close to zero but not quite, in an area with very high baseline transmission potential, the ability of a lot of mosquitoes where it gets uh, very warm, very wet, and um, you can actually get a very rapid rebound once you remove control. So getting to zero and actually staying there and, or sustaining control uh, for a long period of time ends up being very important. If resistance came in gradually over time, uh, where you see an increasing fraction of mosquitoes resistant, you'd see a more gradual creep upward um, as you lost control both on drugs, uh, either on drugs or on uh, insecticide. But here, this was just, th what happened in Garkey was just a complete lifting of, of, of effort. Um, one, one of the other things that we were looking at is what do you expect to see as far as, because one of the important things with respect to a campaign is you want to make sure you, you have the right measurements because you're going to be doing field measurements of what is the impact that you're having. And the important thing is, what are you measuring? Are you measuring incidence? Are you measuring prevalence? Are you measuring some of your entomological correlates? And what do you, and what do you expect to see based on different levels of impact? One of the notable things in terms of uh, Namawala, the site in Tanzania, is it is in the early 90s, it had very high baseline levels of transmission, more than 300 infectious bites per person per year, on average. Some people got more, uh, just based on the distribution. Very high level of baseline transmission intensity. And they had noticed that um, in the dry season, you don't see a sustain, in some areas, you'll see a change in uh, the prevalence of malaria between the high season and the low season. Uh, when, when it, say when it's warmer and rainier to when it's uh, um, cooler and drier, or depending on, on how those are. If you have a high season, low season, you'll see a difference in what fraction of the population tests positive for malaria. And they didn't see as much of that in, in the, at this Namawala field site. When you actually look at it, most of the uh, quote unquote low season months, still av people would average still over six infectious bites uh, in, that, in that month. And so the low season was not all that low. And so in simulation, when you actually do, do a lot of the simulation as far as what you would expect to see um, in terms of prevalence by age and um, prevalence by age and over the course of a year, you won't see as much uh, seasonality. If you could reduce the baseline transmission intensity in Namawala by a factor of five, then all of a sudden not only do you see uh, certain effects as far as overall reduction, you now start to see a seasonality effect in prevalence. So um, in sites like here and lower, you could actually use prevalence to understand some of the changes in transmission intensity. But up here, you're changing in transmission intensity from 
um, by a factor of over 20 from one month to another, and you're not seeing much difference in terms of the prevalence of malaria uh, here. So malaria is a very insensitive measurement up here, but ends up being moderately sensitive here. And in uh, the, some of the areas in, in Garkey and older age groups, it ends up working very well. The other thing that we would look at is what are the models for uh, how long bed nets would actually have an impact. So bed nets in our modeling work have um, two effects. One is uh, two durabilities. One is how, how long is the physical durability? That how long does it last before it starts tearing and just not being able to block the mosquito at all? And then the other is how long does the insecticide that's, part, that's impregnated into the material actually last? And so depending on what you assume, sorry, about your, um, what you assume about the profile for how long it lasts, um, impact what you, what you would observe. If you maintained a flat efficacy for four years and then uh, the bed nets were taken away for a year and then put it back, you'd see a, a transmission intensity that looks somewhat like this. If you end up seeing a, uh, an exponential decay in efficacy as soon as you give them out, you would tend to see a gradual climb in transmission like this. The most realistic one, which seems to look closer to actual field data, would be this one, where you actually, for a certain period of time, a few seasons, you actually uh, maintain close to full efficacy in both the physical integrity and the insecticide, and then you start seeing a uh, decay in, in both, uh, with the physical uh, one being the, the one, typically the one that goes first, and then you'll see a gradual uptick over time as you start getting there and then do it for new distribution and see another uh, growth over time. Two uh, quick takeaways. I want to make sure to get to the Solomon Islands because that's a fun example uh, before for the end and leave some time for questions. Uh, two other things that we were looking at is the impact of vector uh, behavior, going back in terms of looking at details of Garkey, uh, as far as what proportion fed indoors, what proportion fed outdoors, and then also coming back to the impact of assumptions on what you do. When uh, looking at Garkey, they measured, they, they did not separate the, uh, the, the species when they were in the early 70s. They, did the, they went back in the late 70s and measured this. But in the early 70s, they didn't uh, measure uh, how the local populations were spread across the Anopheles Gambier complex. They, they measured just overall for the whole Gambier complex then for Finestis. And they noticed that for the Gambier complex, only 47% of, of the Gambier complex mosquitoes that they found tended to rest indoors after a feed. So that's 47% of um, the Gambia complex would be uh, susceptible to the indoor spring that they did uh, in, in the different villages in Garki. That's one reason why, uh, looking back to that blue to the change from blue to green in, that, uh, in that, their field data, you didn't see as much of an impact there, just because you had a lot of mosquitoes that were uh, Gambia complex mosquitoes uh, that were not resting indoors. But, then it becomes very interesting as far as the, the statistic that we have for the overall complex in Garki at that time was 47% resting indoors. The impact of your interventions that you see, that you see in, in the model depends on whether that's one species or two. So if you have a single species that uh, rests indoor 47% of the time, you achieve a moderately high impact. If you split into two roughly equal populations where one feeds indoors, say, 80% of the time and the other less than 20% of the time, you see even less impact because that 20% popula the t population that feeds indoors only 20% of the time is barely affected at all and manages to maintain very robust transmission. All right, so finishing off with this, this is a, a series of work that we've done in collaboration with some people at James Cook University in Australia and at Notre Dame uh, University uh, in the States. Um, they've been looking at the dynamics of, of Anopheles ferraudi in uh, Haleda Village in uh, the Florida Islands in Central Province in uh, the Solomons. This is, these are a series of sites where you can actually see where all the people are, where the pig pens are, where kind of the larval habitat is. Um, Anopheles ferraudi here tends to breed in these brackish swamps where you get a sandbar that forms, um, water, uh, rainfall lands on the, uh, uh, on the, on the hills, flows down through the soil and accumulates in these swamps behind the sandbars, and most of the breeding takes place in these semi-brackish swamps behind the sandbars. Uh, an interesting thing is on top of that, when there's high levels of rainfall, um, it actually can sweep, uh, sweep down the hill, flush out the uh, lagoon from behind the sandbar, uh, the brackish swamp, 
and uh, clear out most of the larvae that had been uh, growing out, in, out, into the, out into the sea. So we were looking, and we had had a, various, a series of different larval habitat models. And this was one thing where it's great, it's very important whenever you can construct a mathematical model to confront it with field data, confront it with reality, and see where does it work and where does it not work. And for this particular mosquito in this particular location, none of the models for larval habitat that we had worked. None of them was enough to actually see the time series of the dynamics. So we sat down with the field ecologist and said, well, describe to us uh, what ends up happening. So they basically described how this happens, how there's flushing. And they said, uh, the, the number of bites per person per night is going to go from 2 to 60. And we said, well, that's really high for seasonality. They said, it's not due to seasonality. It's due to these major rainfalls. Uh, you can see over here that it's warm throughout the year, so you don't really have a really uh, warm and then cold area. It's, it's islands in, in, in the ocean. It's very nicely buffered there. But you'll get these, uh, and, it's, and there's not a prolonged dry season where it doesn't rain at all for a while. But you have these moments where you get these very high rainfalls where in a single day you can get over 100 millimeters of rain. Um, and these are flush out all the habitat there. So I said, it ends up being the two weeks after these big rainfalls where it gets all the way down to two bites per person per night, and then sometime after that where it climbs back up to 60. So we went back into the model and looked at the module where um, the larval habitat response to uh, weather was done. And we basically constructed something that, that could fill up over time, like a swamp, and add more habitat, but then could get flushed for a certain period of time. And when we did that, we actually ended up matching the, uh, the, field, the characteristics of the field data quite well. Because after a flushing event, the adult mosquito population continues to die without being replaced. Without a major, rain, without a major rainfall, um, adult mosquitoes die, but tend to be replaced by uh, larvae, uh, by mosquitoes emerging uh, from, from the pupal phase uh, from, from the basic uh, aquatic habitat. And so it would tend to be about 16 bites per person per night throughout the year. But after one of these big uh, rainfall events, adults continue to die without replacement. It gets down less than five, sometimes less than four, or even down to two bites per person per night. And then you, but then you had a massive amount of relatively clean uh, habitat without older uh, mosquito larvae to provide a density dependent pressure on the young larvae. And then, so after that, you end up with a lot of emergence of mosquitoes and it en ends up going quite high for a while and coming back down. So we were able to uh, match this you can, and then you can end up seeing the impacts on uh, slide prevalence over uh, approximate slide prevalence and sporozoic rate. So one last thing on this, coming back to uh, the impact of ecology and the impact of mosquito behavior. Uh, right now, uh, various different funders and organizations have been trying to achieve a uh, malaria elimination in uh, the Solomon Islands using primarily bed nets with, w in areas where there was a starting transmission uh, uh, intensity uh, of about six to seven infectious bites per person per year in a number of these areas. But if you actually look at where, and this data is from uh, Tanya Russell, um, if you look at where people are over the course of the evening, indoors versus outdoors, and looking at uh, where the mosquitoes feed, you'll see that the mosquitoes end up uh, feeding predominantly um, outdoors. And even when they feed indoors, it tends to be earlier in the night before people would be under bed nets. So only about 5% of all fee uh, uh, feeds from uh, Anopheles ferouti in these villages could actually be protected by bed nets. This is a, a one notable thing, and we don't have time to get into the details of this, but it's very fascinating, is when they went back and looked at this species about 35 years ago, 40 years ago, um, feeding was more even throughout the night, and feeding was more evenly split between indoor and outdoor feeds. Um, and then now, after extensive levels of uh, use of, of uh, bed nets and indoor residual spraying over time, the feeding seems to have shifted in, 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 in this species to primarily outdoors and earlier in the evening. So we basically looked, and uh, if you have only 5% of feeds uh, that can be addressed with bed nets, then you see some drop in EIR, but not enough. And so one of the things that we're doing moving forward now is, is looking at a series of different things related to larval control and other forms of adult control that can be done in these villages to actually try and get uh, build on the partial reduction that they've seen to actually get it all the way down to zero. And there's a number of people that I'd like to thank and uh, can take a few minutes of questions. Yes.
So a great question. Um, so if you, look at, if you look at here, this end right here ends up being about 9 p.m. Um, and then here's the 9 to 12 hour. Um, I, it, if you look at this is the time course of how many people tend to be outside in a given area. A lot also has to do with housing conditions as far as, you know, if, if people are going to sleep kind of on mats outside of, outside of the house, if people are going, whether they're going to be sleeping indoors or outdoors, what actually is classified as indoors or outdoors. Um, so that, but that, that's a fascinating question and it shows how some of these um, different, some of these different uh, cultural aspects and uh, as far as housing conditions, where people sleep, when do people sleep, um, are going to be interacting with the mosquito population in, in ways that actually affect whether you can control it with, uh, with bed net tools. So that, that ends up being, so changing people's sleep patterns ends up being a, a, tougher, a, a tougher thing to do. But the question is, what can you do as far as for that village, as far as changing the larval habitat around it, uh, changing the way, uh, what happens to mosquitoes, flying back and forth between the houses in the village and the swamp area. Can you get mosquitoes during that area there? Uh, can you use uh, repellents, which would work even when they're outdoors, like if someone has, you know, co uh, burns coils in the different uh, houses? What are the things that you can do that could actually achieve an impact? In Indonesia, they had a similar situation and actually a use of uh, burning spatial repellent coils actually was able to reduce um, uh, malaria in some, of those, in some of those villages, depending on, on, on how it was done. So it, it basically, but a lot of this comes back to the fact of malaria control wouldn't be a one-size-fits-all approach. You have to look at kind of the local details of the mosquito, look at the local details of housing, look at kind of the times that when people are out. Um, there's this one, there's a couple areas where you see a big increase in malaria prevalence in um, men uh, as, they move, as they become teenagers. And this ends up becoming because a lot of it is actually, a lot of the malaria transmission actually happens through agricultural or forest or different types of, of work there. And that's when they get exposed to, to the malaria. And you actually see low prevalence as far as how much people have been exposed to it when they're younger. But it ends up completely being associated with the culture and the work practices there. And so then you have to say, well, in that particular context, what can we do to help uh, protect and limit transmission in those contexts? But it's an uh, excellent question. Yeah. Um, I'm curious to know about uh, how you study the uh, link between the predictors or the independent variables and the outcomes. For instance, how did you um, study the link between the rainfalls and the um, mosquito bugs? Oh, great question. So for that, you want to look at a couple, you have to, you can't, it's difficult to do it just for a generic site pointing at a map. You want to use these uh, very well instrumented field sites where they're actually collecting um, the weather data, they're collecting the, the uh, mosquito data, and they're collecting the parasite data in the human population. And then you can uh, reconstruct a model using a, a relatively small set of parameters for that area. So we, we uh, for instance, for uh, say temporary uh, puddle habitat, there will be a basic uh, functional relationship looking at how, how fast puddles disappear uh, at different rates, of, um, different rates of temperature, rainfall, humidity, et cetera, in a, in a given location. But then uh, you'll, you, we'll, have two basic we'll have two basic variables. One is for a given area, how much overall capacity does it have to have puddles, which kind of me, as it says like per square hundred meters or whatever, how, me, how much mosquito larval habitat can you have? And then the other one depends on kind of the soil conditions as far as how fast in that overall general functional form for um, uh, based on rainfall, uh, humidity, temperature, how fast does larval habitat go away uh, as a function of uh, how fast puddles would disappear? So then, so, so then continuing on to that, You'll basi you basically go back and you fit those two uh, parameters to the overall time series of measuring the adult uh, populations in there. So if you have the adult populations and you have the weather, you, you, can, you adjust to uh, those two parameters until you get the best uh, uh, value fit for that. But that's a model for that particular area then. 
and how accurate it would be yeah. would uh, well, this wasn't would de would, would uh, decay at all the viruses. This is what the their study, of, yeah, kind of, it was just the same. Um, there is the local um, surveillance in and, uh, uh, many of the different so countries, what, what but some have stronger surveillance. So one thing that we're actively working on this year is how can we use topography If you look at other graphs, there is surveillance there that shows soil moisture information from satellite remote sensing data to provide better predictors of that particular thing. But that's a very, uh, yes. very current topic of research as far as how do we move away from the well-instrumented sites to the less well-instrumented sites. Well, there's, it really depends on, you know, there's different virulence factors that all viruses have, but sometimes we have a mild year, sometimes we don't, and that's all still under study. Um, they, th they think that um, some of the surface proteins do play a role in that, but once again, it really depends. They, you can tell and just say, oh, that virus is going to be bad because it has this on it. It's yes, really every year yes, exactly. you kind of see what's circulating. And that's why the surveillance is important to see what's really happening with the viruses that are circulating that year. This model, maybe you help me with that. Yes. But I, I don't really understand the source of that anyway. Good. Black conf. Black conf. So maybe you have some possibility to detect the viral particles. Oh, uh, it's a great question. It's a, it's oh, a so great question for the people at, uh, at Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. But um, so we, we, uh, this, this model wasn't, wasn't used in those things there. What they were doing yeah, is they were looking at, uh, record, at health records, both in terms of uh, facility records, verbal autopsy records, um, you know, from a number of different sites, and, and trying to use those to estimate not, um, uh, how many deaths there, there is. There is aerosol um, there, there so are, there's kind of the World Malaria Report um, that the WHO puts together each year, and then uh, this was the, a, a different one in that global burn disease. So they, done those they agreed on a lot of things, but it's not part of routine surveillance to do that. But they disagreed on a couple aspects, one in terms of the malaria deaths in older children and adults. And then uh, the burden of mal uh, the, the number of malaria deaths um, outside, uh, in, in, in say, across South Asia and, and a couple other specific areas. And so a lot of that comes from the fact that we're dealing with, uh, in some areas, very sparse data, um, issues of, of the quality of different facility records. And you can apply uh, different assumptions to different sources of sparse data, and you, you can end up with different answers. I think the methodology of World Malaria Report is, is, is very well understood. Um, I think people are now, through the series of articles in Lancet, starting to understand the uh, global burn disease methodology. And I think there, over the next couple years, there's going to be an interesting uh, progression as far as understanding how those assumptions and how they, how they each treat relatively sparse data about disease burden in some of these areas to get their conclusions. Um, it, but, but a lot of it just comes down to the fact that uh, the, the, uh, our, our coverage as far as our ability to uh, do, do, uh, uh, get precise causes of death for the different deaths that happen in, in these other areas across different age ranges is, is, is not great. And so assumptions are made and uh, that becomes a, 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 a real issue. But they agreed on some things and disagreed on, on other things. But it, it's a better question for uh, Chris I, Murray I and the others. So indulge me to ask me, I know we, we should end, but um, many, many years ago, well, Five ten years ago, I used to go to the um, as a website mapping malaria risk in Africa, Mara that I that I would mm -hmm. go and show students here, right. and but it hasn't been updated from my understanding in a while. Which so the source of data that you use in your models, um, to, you know, to look at the historical right. evidence and then project forward is very crucial. Absolutely. And I, I don't know if you have any information about the effect of, right. of MAP. Great, great question. So um, a lot of, a, a, lo a very good current source of data on, on mapping, um, mapping ma uh, malaria is there's the Malaria Atlas Project, which is run out of Oxford University. Uh, so Simon Hay and a couple others are very involved in that. They, they work with um, facilities and ministries of health all over the world to try and get um, overall prevalences of uh, falciparum malaria. And uh, they did a, uh, a map for, pre uh, for overall extent of uh, falciparum in 2007 and just recently published their 2010 map. Um, they've just put out one uh, about the extent of Vivax transmission, which is kind of the next thing that they do. But they've kind of continued on with a lot of that work and they try and update it on a regular basis. The other thing they've done also in the Larry Atlas project is trying to map out um, using certain uh, different models for understanding um, ecological viability and where field observations have taken place and expert opinion about 
where you will find different mosquito species. Where will you find Gambiensis streaks? Where will you find Arabiensis? So, if you, uh, so Malaria Atlas Project would end up having a lot of, the mo of up to date, uh, more as up to date as possible uh, results on that. Thank you. Hi, great. So, thank you. Oh, thank you very much. thank our speaker, and especially in this case, we make him an honorary uh, public health person. <laughs> or you're not honorary, you're already doing the work. So thank you oh, so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.